It gives me great pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, the well-known Israeli journalist and historian Tom Segev. While the connection between the Holocaust and Israel may seem obvious, this is in fact the first time in the long history of the Holocaust Memorial Week program that the topic has been addressed from this podium. The Holocaust and its legacy continue to have a profound impact on Israel and Israelis. And if you saw the newspapers over the weekend, you may have read the statement by Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, condemning the Holocaust and expressing sympathy for its victims. Such a statement may seem straightforward and simple, but it is complicated by the fact that uh, President Abbas himself wrote a controversial book 30 years ago on the Holocaust and Israel. Moreover, it comes at a time when negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians are again on the brink of rupture. It is no secret that many commentators in the media and ideologues of all persuasions paint Israel and its relationship with its Arab neighbors in black and white. The reality is that nothing about Israel, not its founding, not its ideology, not its history, is in fact simple or straightforward. Nor should we expect Israel's relationship to the Holocaust to be simple and straightforward. Our speaker tonight, Tom Segev, has never been one to simplify the complexities of history. For 30 years, he was a columnist uh, for Haaretz, Israel's leading liberal newspaper, where he weekly goaded the conscience of his readers. Likewise, his many books always call attention to Israel's contradictions, its ambiguities, and its ironies. The very titles of his books chronicle the history of the Jewish state from its founding through its recent transformations in the 21st century. Among his titles are One Palestine Complete, Jews and Arabs under the British Mandate, uh, for which he received the National Jewish Book Award in 2001. Another title, 1949, The First Israelis. Another title, 1967, Israel and the War that Transformed the Middle East. And my favorite title, Elvis in Jerusalem, Post-Zionism and the Americanization of Israel. The Holocaust, too, has long absorbed Tom Segev's interest. On this topic, he's the author of Soldiers of Evil, the Commanders of Nazi Concentration Camps, The Seventh Million Israelis and the Holocaust, and most recently, a biography of Simon, Simon Wiesenthal, Simon Wiesenthal, The Life and Legends. The Wiesenthal book was, incidentally, chosen by the book critics of the New York Times as one of the 10 best books of 2010. Although Tom Seged writes in Hebrew, he has found a worldwide readership. The list is staggering, but translations of one Segev book or another can be found in English, German, French, Dutch, Polish, Czech, Slovak, Romanian, Japanese, Arabic, and Turkish. Did I leave out Spanish? Unfortunately, not. No. A native, not yet. A native Israeli, Tom Segev was born in Jerusalem and studied at Hebrew University. No stranger to academia, he received his PhD in history from Boston University. And in recent years, he has been either a fellow or a visiting professor at Rutgers, Princeton, Northeastern, Berkeley, and Monash University in Australia. He is currently writing a biography of Israel's first prime minister, David, David Ben-Gurion. Will you join me now in welcoming to Corvallis, Dr. Tom Segev. Thank you very much. Those of you who follow the news from Israel may have read last week that the Ministry of Education is introducing a new Holocaust Studies program 
this one for children in nursery schools. And um, before um, we end this evening, I hope that um, you will understand where a decision like that fits into the collective identity of uh, Israelis. But I'm going to start my uh, remarks tonight with reference to a person I know next to nothing about, a woman called Rivka Waxman. She was one of the first Israelis, a new immigrant from Poland. It's been over 25 years now since I first uh, read her story, and the story was often repeated since, and nobody has come up and told me anything about Rivka Waxman, and so I have no alternative but to repeat it to you as I first heard it. It happened on one of the first days of 1949, a few months after Israel's independence was declared. The first Arab-Israeli war was coming to a close, and it was one of Rivka Waxman's first days in Israel. She went out shopping on Herzl Street in Haifa, and suddenly she noticed a soldier who emerged from a jeep and walked up to the ticket window of a movie theater. Mrs. Waxman froze on the spot and called out, Chaim! And the soldier turned around, and for the next few seconds they stared at each other. It was Chaim, and Rivka Waxman was his mother. For the last time she had seen him eight years before, when he was 14. They were separated by the Second World War, and until they met again on Herzl Street in Haifa, she believed that her Chaim had perished in the Holocaust, and he also believed that he would never see his mother again. A popular afternoon daily published the story on the same day, and indeed it had symbolic value. Thousands of people, young and old, had been torn from their loved ones during the Nazi occupation of Europe and never knew what had become of them. In the ghettos, the forests, the camps, the deportations. And in Israel, they found each other again, either by coincidence or by way of mouth or by ads in the newspapers or by a heart-rendering radio program called Who Knows Who Recognizes, Mi Makir Mi Odea, calling out names on the radio looking for uh, people. I'm now uh, talking to you about my own memory. The names called up on, on, on the radio belong to the voices of my childhood. Um, Tzvi Leibovich, now in Kibbutz Givat Brenner, formerly from Lodge, is looking for his brother Leon Leibovich, formerly from Lodge, whereabouts unknown. And the names go on and on and on. Um, to us, this was all new. And it was only much, much later that I realized how many people had actually known about the Holocaust in real time. Of course, there were thousands of Germans who knew, and there were also foreigners in Germany who knew. Foreign diplomats, foreign correspondents, Red Cross people, clergy people. They didn't know everything, they didn't know all the details, but they knew enough to know that the Nazis were systematically killing the Jews. There were also survivors who were managed to get away and um, they also reported the truth. And much of it was also known to the Jewish community in Palestine. If you go through the newspapers at the time, somewhere among the pages of Davar, you can find a small item reporting that the Germans are pushing Jews 
into the gas chambers and that is happening next to a tiny little town in Poland called Oshwienci, which is uh, Auschwitz. Now why do I say somewhere among the pages of the paper? Because news about the extermination of the Jews very rarely hit the main headlines of the Hebrew press in Palestine during World War II. The two main stories that uh, interested the newspapers were the events of the war, World War, and the conflict with the Arabs. The story about the persecution of the Jews was treated as a local angle of the real story. And the assumption was that the only way to save the Jews was to defeat uh, Germany during the war. They knew and they published very little of what they knew. And when asked about it after the war, several editors of the newspapers explained a, they didn't know what to do. They, they really couldn't internalize the horrors of the information which appeared on their um, desks. They couldn't verify the information. And they felt a responsibility not to cause um, unnecessary um, panic. So the attitude of the Hebrew press to the Holocaust um, is a very, very fascinating subject. It's worth uh, a book, and books have been written about it. From a professional point of view, I can tell you that the Hebrew press actually missed the greatest story of the 20th century. But it was not the Hebrew press in Palestine alone. Most newspapers of the world, including the New York Times, missed that story. But the newspapers in Palestine did not report the Holocaust also because they realized that the Zionist movement was unable to do anything for the Jews. Now, almost everything I'm saying tonight is worth a book, and of course, many books have been written about the attitude of the Zionist movement and about the question whether or not there was anything the Zionist movement could do to save uh, the Jews. Zionism more or less predicted the Holocaust, but in real time, Zionism was actually unable to do much. Why do I say much? Because there were several rescue uh, schemes which uh, may have been missed. Uh, one for the Jews of Slovakia, one for the Jews of Romania, Romania, and one for the Jews of Hungary. Every one of those cases is very, very complicated and very, very painful. And I think what's bothering about them more than anything else are the question marks hanging over them, still today. And question marks can often be more painful than uh, solid facts. So we always return to these three cases and um, I have given a lot of thought to them and I live with the question marks. I can't tell you that these uh, opportunities were not missed and I can't tell you that they were. But what is more bothering uh, to me is the fact that so many leaders of the Zionist movement cared so little for the Jews of Europe. They were preoccupied with the events in Palestine. The need to lay the foundations for uh, the State of Israel interested them more, and of course the struggle with the Arabs. Now you have to remember that the economic situation in Palestine during the war was quite good because the British had made Palestine a supply center for their armies in the Middle East. Um, it was only for a few months in 1942 that people in Palestine were really worried, and that was when it seemed that the German army might invade Palestine. I'm now talking about the war in uh, North, um, North Africa. But the British held the Germans back, and the prevailing feeling among the Jews of Palestine was, 
we have been saved. And that, of course, made it also difficult to organize identification with um, the extermination of the Jews. Now, there were several very interesting things that happened in, in that uh, connection. The uh, extermination of the Jews was still going on, but in Palestine, it was treated as if it had already been done. It's part of the past. The assumption was that the Nazis are murdering 7 million Jews, and there's nothing to do about it. It has happened, and so let's turn our attention to the future. What can be done uh, from now on? So um, most of the victims of the Holocaust were still alive when Israel, Zionist Jewish uh, politicians, the future Israeli politicians, began to accuse each other for not having done more to save the Jews. But they are still alive. But you are already accusing each other for having missed that opportunity. Most Holocaust victims were still alive when the first architectural plans were designed for the establishment of the Yad Vashem Memorial um, Campus. It's quite amazing. You have plans where, where they, they, they uh, plan exactly how to remember the victims who are still alive. And the name is also on these plans. The name is Yad Vashem. This is in 1942. And most victims of the Holocaust were still alive when um, legal experts began to study the possibilities to demand reparations from Germany after the war. And of course, everybody was busy planning for the establishment of the State of Israel. And I'm working now on the biography of Ben-Gurion. And um, there are many books out on Ben-Gurion's attitude to the Holocaust. At this point, I haven't really reached that chapter but in writing, but uh, it seems to me that Ben-Gurion did not regard the Holocaust first and foremost as a crime against humanity. He did not regard the Holocaust first and foremost as a crime against the Jewish people. He regarded the Holocaust as a crime against Zionism, or to be more specific, against the State of Israel in the making. Another question which um, justifies a book is to what extent does the State of Israel owe its existence to the Holocaust? You know, that many people say, well, uh, you benefited from the Holocaust and that's how the State of Israel uh, came about. Now, the Holocaust did um, uh, become instrumental diplomatically, as a diplomatic argument um, between 45 and 48. But the Zionist enterprise in, in Palestine really started at the latest in 1918. That is to say that the State of Israel was really born out of 30 years of very systematic national um, efforts. And I would assume that Israel would have been born without the Holocaust also. On the contrary, the Holocaust was actually a very, very heavy blow to the uh, Zionist dream, because the Zionist dream was a European dream. And the founding fathers and mothers of the State of Israel, uh, what they saw in their vision was a basically European society, a country based on European values and, and, um, and European culture. But most of the European Jews who could have come to Israel were now gone. And so um, when the magnitude of the Holocaust became clear, a man like Ben-Gurion reluctantly discovered the Jews 
living in the Arab countries. There's a page in his diary, which I think carries the date of, um, I don't know, which May of 1945, uh, where it looks like a page from an accountant, uh, really. He writes down, there were so many Jews in Russia, so many Jews in Germany, so many Jews in Poland, so many Jews here, so many Jews there, so many Jews are gone, and now he makes a list of how many Jews live in different Arab countries, and they are the ones uh, who, with whom he will have to build uh, the State of Israel. And I think that the more time passed, the more disappointment, disappointed he became, because he was afraid that people who did not, do, do not bring with them European culture uh, will not be up to the challenges which the State of Israel uh, faces. And that already brings us to uh, the 1950s. And the 1950s are the height of a period which I call the period of the Great Silence. These were years of shame and years of guilt feeling. The survivors who did come uh, to live in Israel felt, many of them, felt guilty for having stayed alive. And more than once they were expected and even required to feel ashamed. The assumption was, and David Ben-Gurion said so specifically, the assumption was that it's, if somebody survived the Holocaust, it must be an evil person, because he must have survived on the expense of somebody else. And so the general feeling was that um, Holocaust survivors um, are, are evil people. Holocaust survivors were generally referred to in official documents as human debris. Again and again, Holocaust survivors were required to explain why they did not defend themselves. The assumption being that we, proud Israelis, uh, descendants of uh, Judah, Maccabi, and, and uh, the biblical heroes, we would have defended ourselves. And so these Jews from the diaspora were constantly required to say, why did you not defend yourself? Um, they radiated weakness, which many Israelis resented. There's a famous uh, story uh, written by Aaron Appelfeld, the Israeli writer, about a boy who survives the Holocaust and comes to live in a kibbutz about 12 or 13 years old, and the other kids in the kibbutz demand that he gets sun tent, like them, and become a real Israeli. And he tries, he spends all the time in the sun, but he remains pale, and so they beat him up. And he said, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm really spending all my time, in, and, and, and I don't get sun tent, what can I do? So in his paleness, he forces the the, 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 the weakness of, of the Jew on these uh, Israeli kids, and um, th they don't want to be reminded that uh, not that the, the, the weakness, and, and so they beat him up. And there was a common, very common um, slang term used in those years, referring to Holocaust survivors as soap, sabon, referring to the wrong assumption that the Nazis uh, were manufacturing soap from the bodies of the Jews. Holocaust survivors were also very often uh, asked, why didn't you come here before, in the 20s? Why didn't you see the Zionist light as we did? By staying behind, you let yourself be killed, making the Jewish people weaker. In other words, these victims were accused of having been uh, victims. Nobody wanted to hear their stories. These people came from hell, and there was nothing more they needed than a sympathetic ear, and Israelis in general wouldn't listen to their experiences. 
This is the story which uh, generated the term the 81st blow. This is a story about a boy who uh, was caught by the commander of a, a, a true story of, of by the commander of a, of a concentration camp for having in his possession, I think, uh, uh, books or, or some kind of uh, literature. And the camp commander uh, beats him. Uh, 80 lashes he gets. And um, when he comes to what was then Palestine and tells his relatives about it, they say, you are lying. If, if, you, if you were treated that way, you were dead. But so, so that can't be true. And that to him was the 81st blow. So that's a very uh, famous term. But we are also talking about uh, veteran Israelis who often felt guilty themselves. These are young people who left uh, their towns in Eastern Europe, in Poland, and moved to Palestine to become pioneers, usually leaving their parents behind. Now the parents were gone. So it's a very natural thought for such people. Uh, should I have stayed with my parents? Is there anything I could have done for my parents? So they felt uh, guilty. Collectively, they also felt guilty for having done practically nothing um, as, as, a, as uh, part of, of, of the Zionist movement. So they, there was both a collective guilt feeling and, and a personal guilt feeling. And concerning the, the collective guilt feeling, Holocaust survivors often asked veteran Israelis, so why didn't you come? Why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you come to us? Why didn't you? And worst of all, why didn't you care more? Look at your newspapers. Uh, look how often uh, you went to the movies, to the theater, to the opera, to the, to the, to the fashion shows um, uh, in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv. There was also the very uh, everyday uh, level. There was the question of how do you live with uh, people who survived Auschwitz, people who walk around with blue numbers on their arms? Um, how do you live with them in an apartment building? How do you work with them? How do you ride with them on the bus? How do you go to a movie with such people? How do you go to the beach with such uh, uh, people, how do you fall in love with them? How do you accept their children in the schools? And I think that never before um, was any society uh, confronted with a similar difficulty of living with the other. The uh, solution that society found it was very easy. Let's not talk about it. Everybody agreed that the best thing is not to talk about it. And that's when the Holocaust became practically a taboo, almost a complete taboo in Israel. Parents wouldn't tell their children about it, and children wouldn't dare to ask. Now, Something we did learn about the Holocaust, even at school. When I grew up in Israel in the late 1950s, the Holocaust was depicted mostly in form of Nazi sadism. Very, very little was said about the political and ideological background that made the Holocaust possible. We were given to read books by a writer publishing under the pseudonym Katsetnik. Some of it, I must say, uh, in hindsight, was rather pornographic. Katsetnik described sexual atrocities and acts of cannibalism. And when in 1961 he appeared as a witness in the Eichmann trial, he defined Auschwitz as another planet. In other words, the crimes of the Nazis 
really happened beyond the sphere of history. When uh, Israel's Holocaust memorial culture began to take shape, it was at the beginning a rather political and sectorial uh, affair. Organizations of survivors tried to get a place in history for themselves. And that's when we heard a lot about the uh, uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto, a rather marginal event, actually, in the history of, of the Holocaust. And we also heard a great deal about Jewish collaborators with uh, the Nazis. In other words, the, the first confrontation with the Holocaust was really based on, 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 on rather pervert uh, phenomena of Jews collaborating with the Nazis or, and, and on, a, on a rather um, exceptional uh, phenomena as, as, the, as the few uprisings. So, in other words, we treated the story as a story of heroes and of villains rather than treating it first before anything else as a story of victims. And we accused ourselves for uh, having done wrong before we even uh, began to uh, understand, try to understand the, the, at least the magnitude of, of, the, of the Nazi crimes. There was uh, a great uh, famous, famous trial, several trials were actually held for, for Jews who collaborated with the Nazis in concentration camps, Kapos, um, but there was a very famous trial of a man called Rudolf Kastner, who was uh, one of the leaders of the Jewish community in Hungary, and he had made an agreement with Eichmann. And um, we, um, uh, this, this was uh, the first r real, uh, real encounter uh, with the Holocaust, a Jew who made a Pact with, with the devil. And this lasted until about 1960, and it changed as a result of the abduction of Adolf Eichmann in Argentina. Eichmann was, uh, as you know, a Nazi official who dealt mainly with the organization of the extermination of the Jews. The abduction of Eichmann is also a very, very interesting um, story because um, until he was actually brought for trial in Jerusalem, the Israeli secret services cared very little for Eichmann or for any other Nazi criminal. Uh, the uh, search for Nazi criminals was not at all on the list of priorities of the Israeli secret services. Israel was a very future-oriented country, and uh, no one thought that uh, we need to invest anything in the search for old Nazis. And the amazing story here is that uh, there were actually a number of Jews living abroad who forced Israel um, to search for um, Eichmann. One of them was Simon Wiesenthal, who again and again and again uh, asked, where is Eichmann, where is Eichmann, where is Eichmann? And the other man uh, was a Jewish prosecutor in Germany by the name of Fritz Bauer, who actually learned uh, through his own sources that Eichmann was hiding in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Now, he realized that if he informs the authorities in Germany, nothing will happen. Uh, Eichmann will be able to escape. And so he did something which, by all accounts, is improper. He informed the secret service of another country, in this case, uh, the Israeli Mossad. And the Israeli Mossad did nothing, because they didn't care for, for Eichmann. And so many months passed, and German prosecutor General Fritz Bauer 
uh, turns again to the representative of the Mossad in, in, in Bonn at that time, West Germany, and says, well, are you doing anything about Eichmann? I can't hold this information anymore. I really have to. So the Israeli Mossad sends uh, a very um, unimaginative uh, agent to Buenos Aires, and he comes back and says, it's not him. I didn't, I didn't find him. So maybe he wasn't at home, Eichmann, or I don't know what he was. But they, they, he had the address and everything. No, I couldn't find him. So uh, two years actually passed until uh, Mr. Bauer uh, went to Jerusalem and um, talked to heads of the Mossad and told them it's now or never. And it was at that point when David Ben-Gurion gave the Mossad an order, okay, go and, go and get him. And if you go on the internet site of the Israeli Mossad, believe it or not, there is such a thing, uh, you will find a very heroic description of how they were able to capture this monster as if they always wanted to do that, as if that had always been on top of their priorities. In reality, uh, I always feel, uh, this is, this is dear, dear Mossad agent, this is what you do. I mean, what's the big deal here? This is a 54-year-old man, unarmed, coming home from work, as he always did. And so you snatched him and brought him to Israel. What's the big deal here? But this is, it, it, it belongs into the, 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 uh, the heroic mythology of, um, of the Mossad. Now, the reasons why Ben-Gurion decided to have uh, such a trial in Jerusalem is another subject for, for books, and books have been written about it. In 1960, Ben-Gurion felt that the Israeli society needs a national purifying, unifying experience, and uh, that for, for various reasons the Israeli society was very weak at that time. And, and um, that gave the opportunity to, to stage uh, such an experience. Ben-Gurion also felt the need to justify his policy of establishing contacts with West Germany, which was a very, very controversial thing. And of course, he also felt the need to uh, state once and again, once and for all, that he had not been um, 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 that, that he did uh, uh, concern, that, that the Holocaust did concern him. He was not indifferent to the Holocaust. Um, and so uh, the trial began, and um, not immediately, but gradually, Holocaust survivors realized for the first time that their new country needs their story. Um, the trial, which uh, opened in April of 1961, in effect served as a therapy for the entire uh, Israeli society, just as the therapists suggest talk about it. And uh, the big silence was broken. And with the trial, a process begins which gradually over the years made the Holocaust into what it is today, a major element of the Israeli uh, identity. I would say that the Israeli identity is, is, uh, is based on, on several elements. I, th I think the most important one is, is the Hebrew language, and um, the second one is, uh, is some uh, feeling of, of belongingness to the Jewish tradition, and the third one is, is, is the Holocaust, and I'm numbering these uh, before I even say that uh, living in Israel makes part of the Israeli identity, because it doesn't necessarily, uh, uh, somebody can be a professor in Corvallis, Oregon, and still retain his Israeli uh, identity. So you take your identity with you, but the um, Holocaust is definitely a very, very central uh, element and very Jewish element of uh, our 
uh, identity. You can see, you can reconstruct how the Holocaust became gradually um, part, such an important part of our, our uh, identity by comparing, for example, uh, the number of hours dedicated to the teachings of, uh, of the Holocaust in, in Israeli schools. The number grows all the time. And uh, in fact, in high school, it is compulsory by law, uh, special law, to, uh, to study the Holocaust. And it worked. Out of 10 Israeli high school kids, eight answer, yes, I am a Holocaust survivor. Why are you a Holocaust survivor? You were born in Israel. Your father was born in Israel. Your grandfather was born in Morocco. Why are you a Holocaust survivor? I'm a Holocaust survivor because it's part of my identity as, as an Israeli. More important than, than uh, teachings uh, in school is, of course, the Holocaust in the media, the Holocaust uh, in the movies and in everyday life also everyday life of, uh, of uh, high school kids. There are at present 20,000 Israeli high school kids who travel to the uh, German extermination camps in Poland and every year. And that is so interesting because the government doesn't pay for it. The parents pay for it, unless in exceptional cases. Which is to say that there are 20,000 Israeli families who spend about $1,500 to send their children to the camps in, in Poland, which I think is quite extraordinary. And if you have two children, you would do this twice. So I think this is, uh, this is quite extraordinary. And uh, in recent years, uh, these groups sometimes uh, well, first of all, these groups always include children whose parents are from non-European origin, parents who come from Arab countries, that's of course, but they sometimes also include Arabs, Arab students, and they sometimes include uh, children of the Orthodox, which is not uh, to be taken for granted because the Orthodox communities in, in Israel have their own problem, their own philosophical, religious problem with the Holocaust, and they are beginning to uh, relate to the Holocaust the way the non-Orthodox uh, do. The Orthodox have, of course, the problem, why did God allow uh, the, the Holocaust? And, and uh, a large number of the Holocaust victims, perhaps most of them, were Orthodox Jews, so how come this happened? And they uh, went for the same solution as, as the other Israelis did in the 50s. They just don't, don't talk about the Holocaust. But now they are beginning to. So they are beginning to be part of that um, uh, Israeli Holocaust experience. By the way, the Israeli Holocaust experience is also changing in the sense that more and more uh, um, Emphasis is being put on the um, a murder of children. And that um, come, stems from the fact that most Holocaust survivors were children during the Holocaust. And so you might sometimes get the feeling that um, the Holocaust was a crime against children. There are children's memorials and, and, um, and that's, um, um, I think, a biographical biographical thing. And of course there is not a single day without some reference to the Holocaust in the uh, Israeli media. Now as part of the Israeli identity, the Holocaust has also generated much moral and political discussion. We constantly argue about the proper lessons of uh, the Holocaust. This argument often leads us to consider who we are and whom we want to be. And it is obviously a political uh, argument. Collective memory is almost always the result of 
political decisions. The Eichmann trial still concentrated on the horrors of the Holocaust rather than on the um, ideological and political aspects of Nazism. Holocaust survivors were called up to the witness stand to describe their personal ordeals. Much less was said about the Nazi system. And so the trial laid down the foundations for Israel's official Holocaust memory. There is such a thing. And its main contention was that the extermination of the Jews was a unique crime, unlike anything that had ever happened in history. And so Israelis adopted a firm, almost sacred Holocaust doctrine, and any deviation from that doctrine was, and to some extent still is, considered to be in dangerous proximity to Holocaust denial. The uniqueness of the Holocaust was to add force to uh, um, the uh, separate identity of the Jews as a nation in accordance with the Zionist ideology, which is the existential ideology of Israel. In fact, Israel regards itself as the historical, the, the moral answer to the Holocaust. David Ben-Gurion stated as early as 1946 that the establishment of Israel would constitute proper compensation for the destruction of European Jews. Back in, 19, in the 1950s, the Israeli government seriously considered a proposal to grant posthumous Israeli citizenship to all Holocaust victims. And I think this is also the purpose of encouraging uh, uh, the Hebrew term Shoah, as if it is something connected to Israel, although Hebrew is an everyday language in Israel alone and most Holocaust survivors did not speak uh, Hebrew. It is often very difficult to distinguish between genuine Holocaust sentiments and manipulated Holocaust arguments. Indeed, in Israel, one can find them all. And if you know how to make that distinction, I think then you hold in your hand a key to the understanding of the Israeli um, society. I would argue, for example, that genuine Holocaust sentiments led Israel to bringing that many new immigrants in the 1950s. It was basically an irrational thing to do. 600,000 Jews brought in over a million Jews within two years, let's say. Um, and I think the reason is that um, no um, politician in Israel can make the decision to leave a Jew outside Israel if you can bring him after the Holocaust. I would also argue that genuine Holocaust uh, fears largely led Israel to develop its own nuclear project. Um, again, I think it's much easier for a statesman to decide, yes, we need a nuclear project, than to decide not to have one. After the Holocaust, everything available, we need. And I think uh, uh, the, the the, the whole history of, of the Israeli nuclear project is, is very difficult to study because most of it is still uh, classified, but that one aspect uh, has been uh, documented. Today, there is already uh, information coming out about the role of West Germany in financing Israel's uh, atomic project, which of course adds some irony to, to it. And I think that genuine uh, Holocaust fears led in 1967 to the Six-Day War. Yes, there was a lot of 
Holocaust manipulation prior to the Six Day War. The uh, Israeli Foreign Office in Jerusalem directed the Israeli ambassador in Washington seek for an immediate appointment with the editor-in-chief of the New York Times and convince him that Egypt's President Nasser is a new Hitler. And these are your talking points, A, B, C, D. But Holocaust fears at the eve of the Six-Day War were genuine. I was able to collect nearly 500 letters which Israelis wrote to their friends and relatives, mostly in this country. I went from one Israeli to the other, living here a long time. I said, go up to the attic and go down to the basement and look for letters which you received from Israel in May of 1967. And when you look through hundreds of letters, and these are not letters meant for publication in the New York Times. These are letters from a man to his, uh, to his son and from, from a woman to her sister. And um, when you look at these letters, there's no question about it, that there is genuine fear that we are uh, facing the danger of another Holocaust. And that is when um, um, Israel decides to uh, act against Egypt. Of course, there is no Arab leader who has not been compared at one time or another to Hitler. Prime Minister Begin, in 1982, actually wrote a letter to President Reagan informing him that he is sending the Israeli army to Beirut to capture Hitler in his bunker, meaning uh, Yasser Arafat. So, as I said, these three major decisions are definitely generated in part by the Holocaust the massive immigration, the Project Dimona, and, and uh, the Six-Day War. And I think uh, we can add that uh, the decision to organize Israel as a democratic society also stems in part from the Holocaust, although the uh, uh, democratic practice was uh, very common in the Zionist movement long before the Holocaust. But of course, the meaning of uh, democracy uh, is a matter of political arguments, and there the Holocaust comes in all the time uh, uh, with us. The students who are traveling to Poland are most usually requested to recharge their patriotic batteries there. Uh, at the entrance to the gas chambers, they hoist the Israeli flag and uh, uh, very often uh, sing Israel's national anthem. And they are supposed to come back knowing, A, never again, B, Israel must be stronger than all its enemies combined, C, Israel is the victim, Israel is the eternal victim, and as a victim, Israel can't do wrong. The message is usually very pessimistic. The whole world is against us. We are alone, uh, and uh, we face a second Holocaust. This is where uh, Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu's speeches about Iran fit in. But not surprisingly for uh, a deeply divided society like Israel, some schools expect their students to recharge their humanistic batteries uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the extermination camp. And there is a humanistic approach to the Holocaust. Um, some Israeli humanists even objected to the execution of uh, Eichmann, Martin Buber, and, 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 and others. And the Holocaust is, of course, a very legitimate and, 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 and very forceful uh, source for um, principles of uh, human rights and, and, and uh, the fight against racism. So such uh, students will be uh, taken, for example, to a monument in memory of the Sinti and Roma, the, the gypsies. Um, and things are changing in that direction very slowly. At the new National Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, there is some reference, not very visible, but uh, some reference is made to the Nazi euthanasia program and to the persecution of gays and Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, genocide studies are now uh, available in, in Israel. So things are beginning 
to change some people are rethinking the Holocaust. Yehuda Bauer, for example, Israel's uh, most senior Holocaust scholar, has ventured to rethink the uniqueness of the Holocaust in a book, the English title of which uh, is in fact Rethinking the Holocaust, while the more prudent and less provocative uh, title in Hebrew is simply Thoughts about the Holocaust. And uh, um, in a chapter called Comparing the Holocaust to Other Cases of Genocide, Bauer counts a number of Holocaust singularities, including the ideological and racist motivation of the Nazis, uh, as well as the global and total purpose of the extermination of the Jews. These qualities, according to Bauer, uh, single out the Holocaust, but in a final statement, uh, Bauer describes the Holocaust as an extreme form of genocide. And this is as far as one uh, may go officially in Israel today. Outside of Israel, the subject uh, has been taken further. One uh, particularly interesting voice to me came from the late Simon Wiesenthal. Largely known as the Nazi hunter, Wiesenthal developed a wide humanistic universal concept of the Holocaust. He saw the extermination of the Jews first and foremost a crime against humanity, against the Jews as part of humanity, but not against uh, the Jews alone. Wiesenthal regarded the extermination of the Jews as an inevitable result of the crimes the Nazis had first committed against the Germans themselves. And he did not hesitate to compare the Holocaust to other genocides which happened after uh, World War II, such as uh, in Cambodia and in Rwanda and the Balkan Wars. And I think today he would probably uh, mention Syria as well. I think it's not unnecessary to mention that um, Wiesenthal's basic approach to the Holocaust caused him considerable difficulties, particularly in Israel, and in the Holocaust establishment uh, in America. He was respected as most as a Nazi hunter, but much less as a humanistic thinker. So what about the uniqueness uh, of the Holocaust then? I regard the Holocaust as part of European civilization, and it has its roots in other oppressive and murderous chapters in European history. European countries committed horrendous crimes against peoples in America, in Africa, in Asia, and um, in the former century they committed uh, horrendous crimes against themselves, including the Jews. Also I find that all too often the Holocaust is being used too loosely for the sake of ideological and political arguments. This is true also in Israel for both sides of the political spectrum, right and left. Everybody uses the Holocaust uh, as an argument. The settlers uh, wear a yellow star and raise their hands like the little boy in uh, Warsaw, we also saw before, um, and, and um, um, the left, of course, compares everything that happens uh, in the occupied territories to Nazism. Uh, Netanyahu speaks about the Holocaust when he means Iran, and he speaks about Iran when he means the Holocaust. This um, uh, is also my view uh, concerning any comparison between the Nazi uh, occupation policies and Israel's oppressive policy uh, in the Palestinian territories. But I do respect uh, Simon Wiesenthal's approach to the uh, universal and humanistic lessons of the Holocaust. I think that young people in uniform anywhere in the world, including Israel, should be told that they may receive orders which they are not allowed 
to obey. These are manifestly illegal orders. And if they do obey these orders and commit war crimes, they might find themselves in jail even uh, decades after they act just as Nazi uh, criminals did. An Israeli court decision of the 1950s obliges an Israeli soldier to disobey a manifestly illegal order, even in combat situations. And the court expected any soldier uh, to be decent enough to recognize the illegality of such an order. Obviously not an easy thing to do for, for an 18-year-old person. But this, to me, is the most significant lesson Israel learned from the Holocaust so far. There are uh, others uh, which we still have to learn. So I think I uh, leave it uh, at that for the moment. Uh, there are obviously uh, lots of things which I did not uh, talk about. You may want to raise them uh, in your questions. Uh, treatment of Holocaust survivors today in, in Israel, uh, Israelis and Germans, uh, Israel and anti-Semitism. Lots of things to talk about. Thank you very much.